Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our COVID and emergency communicable, emerging, emerging communicable diseases update webinar. My name is Naomi White. I'm Senior Manager of Regional uh, Partnerships and Public Health uh, for Wimmera Grampians at West Vic PHN, and I'll be your facilitator for the evening. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waterways from which we are all zooming in today. We recognise their diversity, resilience, and the ongoing place that First Peoples hold in our communities. We pay our respects to elders, both past and present, and I wish to extend a Let's extend that respect to any First Nations people connecting in today. We commit to working together in a spirit of mutual understanding, respect, reconciliation. Uh, we support self-determination for, for First Nations people and organisations, uh, and we'll work together on closing the gap. Just a little bit of housekeeping today. Uh, the majority, majority of our webinar events are recorded and freely available on our PHN Learn YouTube channel. Uh, they'll there is an access link in the chat. Uh, Katrina's happily working in the background for us today. Thank you. Uh, uh, Westwick PHN upcoming events are on the screen now and you can register for our events on our website. Uh, there should also be a link in the chat for that one as well. Um, a special mention to our upcoming uh, primary care conference for 2023. It's a hybrid event, so there's in-person and online attendances for that. Um, I'll give you two seconds to read that. Um, you can attend in Geelong, Horsham, Warrnambool or Ballarat uh, or dial in remotely. The theme for 2023 is toddler to teen health uh, and registrations are open through to early April. Uh, please make a note of Health Pathways slide on your screen now relating to this event's evening's topic. Um, I think we'll also have a, a drop into chat from that one as well from Katrina um, and Kate will mention Health Pathways later in the evening. Uh, please uh, click the register now button if you don't have access. Um, Attendance for uh, the evening tonight, if your first and last name are not displayed uh, on the uh, screen when you're logged in, um, please type your first and last in the chat box now um, if you cannot. If we can't identify you, uh, we won't be able to send you a, a certificate for attending this evening. Um, questions and answers tonight, there's an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, all participants will remain on mute tonight, so please type your questions in the Q&A box uh, anonymously. Um, and please, again, reminding you the full name in the chat if you um, haven't already got it on screen as well. Uh, we have a number of people that will be answering questions today. We also have an evaluation survey, so please, if this is something that is valuable to you, you would like us to do more of these in the future, um, and please tell us about your experience, then we would appreciate you uh, filling out the evaluation at the end of the, the evening. This will pop up again. Tonight's agenda, um, we've got three speakers tonight, as well as an opportunity for questions. So we have um, from the Barwon Southwest PHU, Dr Naomi Clark, uh, who will be presenting on COVID-19 vaccine update and a transition of management of notifiable conditions uh, from the uh, Department of Health to LPHUs. Uh, following on from this, Professor Rosemary Aldrichs will present on mosquito-borne diseases of concern, of particular reference to those that are within the West Vic region. Um, and then after that, uh, Dr. Kate Graham, um, who you all probably know well from uh, our ECHO series, uh, what, is, what does this all mean for GPs in practice? Uh, and followed by an opportunity for uh, our clinicians and uh, attendees to ask any questions of those here today. Uh, we also have some uh, other members of staff from our LPHUs who are also available to answer some questions as well. Uh, and without further ado, I think I will uh, hand over to Dr. Naomi Clark. Just share my slides. Um, visible? Wonderful. Yes. Um, so thanks everyone um, for attending tonight and listening. Uh, my name is Dr. Naomi Clark. I'm a public health registrar working at the Barwon Southwest Local Public Health Unit. Um, and today I've titled my talk COVID-19 and Beyond Public Health in Victoria. So I'll be talking on two, um, 
two slightly different topics today. My first topic um, is the updated COVID-19 vaccination recommendations. I'll be touching on what vaccines are currently available in Australia. Um, do we know much about vaccine effectiveness against the currently circulating um, subvariants of the Omicron variant of COVID-19 um, and the updated ATAGI recommendations that came out a couple of weeks ago? Um, then I'll shift gear and talk about the management of notifiable conditions in Victoria um, and the integration and transition that's happening um, with management of these conditions um, between the Department of Health and the local public health units to go urgent and routine conditions and, and what does this transition and integration mean for general practitioners. So what COVID-19 vaccines are currently available in Australia or will be shortly available. So we've got the Pfizer vaccination. So there's the original vaccination, which remains available for everyone aged six months or older. Um, we've got the first bivalent, which is a bivalent mix of the original and a stra uh, strain against Omicron BA.1. Um, and then we've got the updated bivalent vaccine, which um, is a bivalent between the original and Omicron BA.4 and 5, and that's expected to arrive in Australia next week for those aged 12 and above. Moderna, very similar, um, except that the original is now only available in Australia in the six month to five year preparation. It's no longer available in the, for above, uh, those above six years of age. Um, very similar with the, um, the two different bivalent vaccines, but the, the more updated bivalent vaccine against BA.4 and 5 is not expected to arrive until early April 2023. And of course, we still have the Novavax and the AstraZeneca original vaccines available. So what do we know in terms of what's happening against the current subvariants? Obviously, there's always a bit of a lag, a new vaccine's developed, and by that time there's new subvariants, and then there's obviously a lag in assessing its efficacy. So currently we're seeing a, a really poly, polyclonal mix of variants um, in circulation. The dominant variant at the moment is called XBF, um, and there's a range of other subvariants um, that we're picking up both in the wastewater here in Victoria as well as in clinical samples that are being sequenced. Um, and there's some evidence both from lab studies as well as from um, a large uh, cohort study in the USA about the evidence on some of these um, some of these newer variants. So um, looking at the Pfizer bivalent, um, the BA4.4 and 5 bivalent does seem to um, induce higher neutralizing antibody titers against some of the new subvariants, so BQ and XBB, than the original Pfizer vaccine. Um, and it also certainly appears to be more protective or effective against hospitalization or death as a result of COVID-19. So this large cohort study in the USA, um, people who'd had the bivalent um, booster as opposed to the monovalent booster had a much higher effectiveness against hospitalization or death. Um, and at the time of this study, there were the BA.4 and 5 variants in circulation, but BQ1 um, was also in circulation. Very similar findings with the Moderna bivalent. Um, so there was a trend seen in lab studies towards higher neutralizing activity against newer Omicron subvariants compared to the original or the um, first bivalent vaccine. Um, and similarly, um, it seems to be more effective against hospitalization or death compared to um, the monovalent vaccine. Sorry if you can hear my children in the background. Um, moving on to the ATAGI update that hit um, the shores about two weeks ago. Um, so it's a quite a significant ATAGI update in that they've uh, really reframed the way they, they're phrasing um, the COVID vaccinations and the boosters. There's significant new ATAGI recommendations on boosters. Um, they've incorporated the Pfizer bivalent Omicron VA 4.5. They haven't yet incorporated the Moderna, I suppose, because it's further away to arrive. Um, and they've removed information about that um, original Moderna formulation that's no longer available. So the new recommendations are broken up into primary course and booster doses. Um, a primary course remains recommended for all people aged five years and over, as well as children aged six months to five years who have severe immunocompromised disability or complex and multiple health conditions. And I suppose it's really the group of children that, that the, the uptake is still low in most adults because of the vaccine mandates have had their two doses of primary course um, quite some time ago, but there's still a lot of children who haven't. And there's particularly a new cohort of children who are turning five, whose parents may just not be thinking about COVID vaccination, but may actually be quite happy to have it if they're reminded of it. So always worth, I guess, um, bringing it up if there's an opportunity available. 
Uh, so the primary course is two doses for everyone unless they're severely immunocompromised, in which case it's three. Um, and there's a brand preference for adults aged 18 to 60 to use Pfizer Original or Novavax um, and for pregnant women, Pfizer Original. Um, for, older, for people aged over 60 or under 18 years, um, there's no specific brand preference. Now the booster doses. So this is where the advice has really been significantly updated. So this advice replaces all previous advice. So we're no longer talking about third dose, winter dose, fifth dose. We're talking about boosters. And the recommendation is that people should get a booster if they're in these groups I'm going to discuss below, if it's been more than six months since their last vaccine dose or confirmed infection. And this should this is the recommendation for early 2023. So the recommendation applies to all adults age 65 and over, as well as adults age 18 to 64 years who have comorbidities that increase their risk of severe COVID-19 or disability with complex and significant health needs. Uh, boosters should be considered for any other adults aged 18 to 64 years who don't fit into those above categories, as well as children um, and adolescents aged 5 to 17 years who have, again, comorbidities um, or disabilities with significant or complex health needs. And at this stage, boosters have not been recommended for other children and adolescents aged 5 to 17 years or any children aged under 5 years. So the recommendation for, for those groups remains, as I mentioned on the previous slide, in terms of primary course. In terms of what um, vaccines to give, ATAGI has indicated that they expect all currently available vaccines will provide a benefit against um, severe COVID-19 infection, but the preference is to use the bivalent boosters over other formulations. And at this stage, they've listed the um, Pfizer bivalent or, or original and Omicron BA45, as well as the Pfizer and Moderna um, bivalent original and Omicron BA.1 vaccines. Um, and I presume they'll be adding the Moderna bivalent BA4.5 once that's um, closer to arrival in Australia. Uh, Novavax and AstraZeneca can also be used as boosters, um, especially if people are preferring not to receive mRNA vaccines, but um, they're not preferred in these um, in general. Um, before I move to notifiable conditions, I'll just briefly give a little update on Evusheld, um, which as I'm sure everyone knows, was previously has, has been approved for use in high risk people for pre-exposure prophylaxis of COVID-19. Um, the stock that was available through the national stock part, national medical stockpile all expired at the end of last year. Um, so Evusheld is still available on the private market, but it's very expensive per dose and is believed to have reduced effectiveness in protecting against the currently circulating Omicron subvariants. So it's really an individual case by case assessment if, you, if there's someone who's extremely high risk and the infectious diseases team at Bowen Health is always um, available to discuss any, um, any specific patient you would, you would like to. So switching tack a bit, talking about notifiable conditions. So I'll give a, a brief background on what notifiable conditions are and then talk about what's happening in that space and what that means for, um, for primary care. So there are currently 84 notifiable conditions in Victoria, um, and these are notifiable under the public health and wellbeing regulations. Um, they, they may be notifiable by registered medical practitioners and or by pathology services. And this means that under legislation, the health department must be informed when these diseases um, are diagnosed. They're almost all communicable diseases. There's a small number of non-communicable things such as anaphylaxis and elevated blood lead concentration, but, but generally they are communicable diseases. Um, the majority are what we call routine notifiable conditions, so they need to be notified in writing um, within a specified time frame, usually five days after diagnosis. Uh, and then there's a handful of conditions that are urgent and they need to be notified by phone essentially as soon as the diagnosis is made or is suspected. Um, obviously, we can add new notifiable conditions. COVID-19 was added. Other diseases have been added recently. Um, but at the moment, we're sitting on 84. And there's a list of those conditions um, and specific details. So I've just shown a little screen grab of, you know, each condition is listed on the website with a little arrow. And below it, it shows whether it's urgent or routine and how that should be notified to the Department of Health. I'm sure this isn't news to people, but just to give that, that, um, that context before I, I talk about what's happening. So... Um, local public health units uh, were set up in Victoria during the COVID-19 pandemic to manage local cases and outbreaks of COVID-19. Um, other jurisdictions such as New South, Wales, New South Wales had existing public health units, but Victoria didn't. So these, these were set up and they were set up through health services across Victoria. 
There are nine local public health units, three in metropolitan Melbourne and six in regional. And so the Western Victoria PHN catchment area includes the Barwon Southwest Public Health Region, which is the um, the lighter purple at the bottom there in southwest Victoria, um, and the Grampians is the, the larger yellow area um, in central West Victoria. Um, and between us, I think we cover 21 um, local government areas, sort of from the west of Melbourne all the way to the South Australian border. And what's been happening is that since July 2022, um, local public health units have been gradually undertaking public health follow up for other notifiable conditions. So we're moving away from being solely managing COVID-19 to taking on other notifiable conditions in a gradual process. And so some of the more common diseases or ones that GPs may have already heard from public health units in relation to are things like Borrelia ulcer, um, hepatitis B and C, Ross River virus, gonorrhea was a recent transition to LPHU, Shigella, Q fever. Um, there's a, a number of others. I thought I wouldn't list them all, but those are some that you, that you may have heard from public health units in relation to um, and the public health units in line with what the Department of Health was previously doing have a range of public health responses, depending on the condition and the urgency. It can range from collecting a little bit of surveillance data to a full on urgent um, case investigation, contact tracing, public health alerts like we would do for a, a measles case, which measles is still sitting with the department at this time. So this is an ongoing transition um, and in the future, um, the expectation is that local public health units will be undertaking public follow-up for virtually all notifiable conditions. Um, we're not exactly sure on the time frame, um, but it's likely to be in the not too distant future. Um, so local public health units are collaborating with the department on the follow-up of notifiable conditions, aiming to add value by adding a local lens. Um, so for example, by providing resources about local referral pathways um, when discussing notifiable conditions with, um, with primary care providers. Um, and for example, by detecting local clusters. So we, we earlier this year detected that there was an increasing number of notifications of Borrelia ulcer in Greater Geelong and were able to work with the department um, to, to provide health advice um, to the public and clinicians about that condition. Um, LPH is also working in partnership with the Primary Health Network, with the GP Liaison Unit, um, with health services and with other local stakeholders um, in our region. And, um, very keen to, to collaborate with our GP specialist colleagues um, as, we, as we integrate this work into the local public health units. What does this all mean for GPs? There's not any change to the process of notifying a notifiable condition. It will still be online um, or by phone. When you call the Department of Health number and select the condition, if it's an urgent condition, you may be rerouted to the public health unit. You may be put through to the department depending on, on where we're up to with the transition. But GPs are very welcome to contact the Bowen Southwest Public Health Unit during business hours. After hours, we can be reached by switch if it's urgent. Um, and as I said, the department phone number will re reroute to us if needed. I've confirmed with Grampians the same applies. We're always, our doors are always open for a call to, hit, to um, request public health advice. And if we need to redirect to the Department of Health, we can, we can do that. Um, so GPs may expect that you'll be contacted by public health officers from time to time from the, the public health units in relation to follow up of notifiable conditions, and you may be contacted more about more conditions than you previously were um, and, uh, experiencing from the Department of Health, because local public health units may be um, implementing, I guess, more rigorous follow up in our regions, depending on our, um, our key priorities. And we welcome any feedback from our GP colleagues on the way that we're managing, um, I guess, our interactions with primary care. Um, we know that um, all of our GP colleagues are very, very busy and we don't want to um, you know, we want to make sure that we were able to work productively to um, collect the information we need about these notifiable conditions and enhance um, and um, in implement our public health actions. So I'll pop the, the contact phone number and email address for the public health unit here. I'm very happy to take a couple of questions now. I unfortunately have to duck off at 7.30, but there's plenty of other people online from the unit to take questions at the end as well. Thank you. Thanks, Naomi. Um, yes, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A section if you have them. Um, and as Naomi mentioned, she's ducking off and there'll be others here to answer those questions. Um, I will monitor the questions to see if anything comes through. Otherwise, uh, we shall uh, move on and uh, start our uh, presentation from Professor Rosemary Aldrich. Thanks, Rosemary.
Can you see that, Naomi? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. I'd like to start by um, adding my acknowledgement to uh, the acknowledgement that Naomi did, acknowledging the unceded lands of, of those where we meet uh, and uh, paying my respect to Elders past, present and emerging and welcoming any First Nations people here today. I'm on Wadirong country today. Um, today, I've been asked to talk about Murray Valley encephalitis and other mosquito-borne diseases. Um, remembering I'm a public health physician and not an infectious diseases physician, um, if there are infectious diseases type questions and uh, clinical questions, which I know there are others more expert than me to answer, then I'll certainly be deferring to my colleagues. Um, Professor Eugene Athan from the um, Barwood Southwest Public Health Unit is here, as is, of course, um, everyone's favourite, Kate Graham, who can talk um, in GP language far better than I can. So please, if there are clinical questions, we can direct them to my learned colleagues. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Grampians Public Health Unit medical team and our contact numbers, just as Naomi did. Um, talk about the distribution of detections of mosquito-borne viruses in Victoria this season. Um, talk a little bit about mosquito species and mosquito control. Uh, talk a bit about mosquito-borne diseases in Victoria. Um, I'll say that the website of the Department of Health has an excellent, um, a, a lot of detail about mosquito-borne diseases and uh, um, is really our source of truth, uh, even in the work we do. I'll also talk about what does all this mean for clinicians and there's some pretty simple take-home messages and then when and how to notify. Um, so my colleagues are here listed in alphabetical order of their first name. Um, and as you can see, we have a very diverse clinical and disciplinary background for our specialists in our unit. Um, a number of our specialists are also enrolled as trainee public health medicine registrars and bring their consultant background as well as their training to being our medical leads as, as required on a daily basis. So I've got a spread of infectious diseases, general practitioner, paediatrician, public health physician. And um, I'd like to acknowledge um, Aaron for his help in assisting with the preparation of some of these slides. As you can see there, there are the numbers for today's uh, medical lead. That's a 24 hour on-call number. We have a um, general inquiry number there for business hours. I've also got the after hours, for those of you who live in the Grampians region, the um, 24 hour on-call number for the infectious diseases physician who's on uh, in infectious diseases physician who's on call for, um, it was COVID, but was happy to take a call for any communicable condition. And then also, as Naomi had done, the um, number for urgent notifiable conditions. So this is the distribution of Murray Valley encephalitis this season. Um, as you can see, not unexpectedly, this is in the more northernmost um, uh, LGAs. Um, Horsham gets a gig and uh, essentially, while there are some LGAs which are more north than Horsham and more north than and uh, northern Grampians hasn't had a detection this year, um, Murray Valley encephalitis hasn't been detected for a long time in Victoria. Um, it's entirely likely that the reasons the others are not coloured is because there's no trapping happening. So essentially, we don't know if mosquitoes are there unless mosquito traps are being laid and set and collected. And there's and we need to remember that there is not a comp, there is not a totally um, blanket coverage of mosquito trapping. So what this tells us, because Horsham was quite late to the piece in terms of detections, and indeed Mildura has had numerous detections, and in one of its um, trapping sites for seven weeks in a row, it's detected Murray Valley encephalitis virus. Um, what this tells us is there's actually very likely a widespread distribution of Murray Valley encephalitis virus across mosquitoes. Um, pretty much north of a line between Bendigo and Horsham so far. Um, here are some uh, uh, the, the local maps for um, Japanese encephalitis, uh, Ross River and Barma Forest. And what we can see here is um, uh, Japanese encephalitis has actually not been detected uh, as a, uh, in mosquitoes this season at this case, at this stage. Um, the green is Ross River virus, and you can see that's distributed and includes um, Wellington Shire on the um, east of the state. We can see Barma Forest is again along the uh, Murray River and a detection in Greater Geelong. Um, people have you know, expressed some perplexity about that, but it might actually have something to do with um, uh, Barma Forest and Ross River virus for, and, and Ross River 
virus are um, alpha viruses that are carried by not only the virus that carries JEV and MVE, Culex and Illorostris, but also a couple of other viruses which are particularly distributed in coastal salt marshy kinds of areas. Um, they were an Aedes species. I won't necessarily go into them, but if you want to know, it's Camptohinctus and uh, and Vigilax, and um, they now they've now got a now a, a new prefix name. But essentially, we know those viruses are along the coast in Victoria, and they do. Um, carry Ross River and Barma Forest virus. So it's not entirely surprising that we see a Barma Forest notification from around the Greater Geelong area. I'll just make a little comment about the pictures you might see as I scatter through this. This one's actually from a Chinese anti-mosquito campaign. And you can see it's, it, for those of you who can see, it might be too small for you to see, that's actually a skeleton riding a mosquito as part of the way that it communicates about the dangers of mosquito-borne disease in China. Now, um, I know these are very small numbers, which is why I've circled and made arrows to help. Essentially, what we saw in November and December in Horsham, which is in my region, and in Loddon, which is just the border of my region, and then Surf Coast, uh, we see quite high numbers of mosquitoes. Usually, we might see in a trap, you know, 20 or fewer. But here you can see um, in Horsham a quite sustained number around the sort of 1,000 or 1,500. And what we saw in Loddon about the same time in late October was no numbers of you know, nearly 12,000 in, in, um, in a trap. And we also saw um, across the whole of Loddon for a sustained period of time. You might remember this was the time that we had floods, but it actually wasn't in the flooded areas we were seeing these. This was more in the, in the slower waters of receding floods or stagnant waters that we were seeing these traps. Surf Coast, you can see a big, a big increase between um, uh, just uh, you know, late October and early November, a, a many fold increase there really peaked in that um, second week of November and then has since receded. And now we can see um, where we are up to. These, these data are the report that came to us from last week. And so um, we can see that Surf Coast has got very few mosquitoes in its traps. Um, Baloke, interestingly, where you would have heard last week or over the recent weeks, um, uh, was the location of a person originally thought to have had JEV later re-diagnosed as having MVE and died and had been travelling between Baloke and Swan Hill. The reason we've only got two records there in Baloke is because until that person came to our attention, they had been doing no mosquito trapping. So it's entirely possible that either they were, they caught their infected mosquito bite in Baloke Shire itself, but like abuts Swan Hill. Um, and so, um, it, and the person was known to travel between the two. Surf Coast, as you can see, has had quite, as I mentioned, low numbers. Interestingly, that Horsham number of 54 and an arrow, that was the week, 54 mosquitoes in one trap. That was the week that we, that um, Murray Valley encephalitis virus was discovered in Horsham. So as you can see, for, for only 54 um, mosquitoes to yield a hit on Murray Valley encephalitis virus would suggest that it's quite widely distributed. So we've got mosquito species, as I mentioned. We've got um, Culex and Illorostris, which is the major vector for uh, Ross River, Barma, Kunjin, West Nile virus is uh, um, its proper name, Kunjin is its variant, um, Murray Valley encephalitis virus, and also important for JEV. JEV is actually carried by about more than 30 Culex species, but not all of them. In fact, very few of them bite the humans. That's the other thing a, a mosquito needs to do is to be a biter if it's going to actually have a vector-borne risk with it. Um, these are the data that are for the week ending the 18th, so a couple of weeks ago now. Um, and as you can see, and as we tracked actually over, over as summer emerged, the fraction of mosquitoes that were trapped with Reculex steadily increased. It started to be a very, very few number, but then it's come up to be far, by far the majority in the western part and the northwestern part of Victoria. And down in southwestern surf coast, Geelong, we've got the, as I mentioned, Camp to Hinches, which is that, that particular um, um, estuarine and saltwater um, loving mosquito, saltwater marsh mosquito that um, also carries Barma Forest and Ross River. So this is where my report gets wordy 
So forgive me, I don't expect you to cover all the words. We'll just cover off the main points. And because we're going to be sending out this presentation later, you can read this at your leisure later if you wish. So essentially, um, most of the mosquito-borne diseases we don't have um, uh, vaccines for. As you know, we do have a JE baby vaccine. Um, but we clearly have to, um, because of the risk and the risk of mortality and morbidity to our community, we have to know and control. And it's not only humans, of course. Mosquito-borne disease is a thing in our animals as well. So there are there's quite a program around early warning surveillance around mosquitoes and mosquito-borne disease. In Victoria, approximately 20 councils in high-risk areas participate in the surveillance program. Um, what we do in Victoria now since 2021 is collect the mosquitoes, count them, mush them up, blend them into a mosquito soup, and then PCR that soup, just like we would have done for blood before. Um, essentially, they do that in an agriculture Victoria laboratory, and the Department of Health is notified the same day there's a result. Um, Human-borne mosquito notifications this season um, have been... Uh, uh, around there have been no these are what this is what we've been looking for but there's been no Jap Japanese encephalitis virus detection so far have been for Murray Valley, Kunjan, Ross River and Barma and um, when I wrote this last weekend which is the latest data I had we had 44 detections in total about across about 12 or 13 LGAs and since um, the fourth of the first was our first and at that, and since then, you know, three quarters of them have been Murray Valley encephalitis virus. Um, as I mentioned, it was trapped in uh, Murray Valley encephalitis virus was trapped in Horsham in the last week of January. And so far this season, we've had one case of Japanese encephalitis who survived, and one case of Murray Valley encephalitis, a person who sadly died. Interestingly, the case of Japanese encephalitis from the history, it looks like they were likely bitten and exposed. Um, in about October last year, and this is before we saw much Culex around, and it's possible that, you know, it's, we speculate these things, but it's possible that, in fact, it's another mosquito that we haven't really paid much attention to who might be carrying um, another mosquito species who might be carrying JEV, um, or it might be um, indeed um, some already infected uh, larvae um, who then hatch and are quickly able to become competent and bite as soon as it warms up. Um, there's a really good section on the Department of Health website on mosquito management in Victoria, and essentially it's a combination of surveillance, chemical control, bite prevention, and physical control by eliminating sources. And, of course, the big message for our community is prevention, 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 loose clothing, using appropriate repellent DEET or pecaridin, um, limit, limiting outdoor activities, especially when mozzies are about, just around the time that people are uh, cranking up their um, barbecues, um, removing stagnant water around a house, using fly screens, nets, sprays, coils, plug-ins when gathered outside, um, carefully reading the labels to make sure that we can apply to children safely and potentially apply to, ch to children's clothing rather than skin and also working to mozzie-proof home. And again, there's a whole list of other things that can be done for our individuals, our, 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 our citizens in how they might do that. There's further resources that I've linked there for your information, but essentially um, I think the Department of Health website, the Victorian Department of Health website, um, and others of its sites that it links to are really, really useful if you're particularly interested in having more detail around this. So importantly, um, as, as um, you would have heard, um, this week it's been announced that because of the risk to um, mosquito-borne diseases in the top half of the state, really, the eligibility for access to JEV vaccination has increased. Um, it's now included five LGAs in the Grampians region. Northern Grampians was already eligible because they had infected piggeries last year. So um, Horsham, West Wimmera, Yarri Ambiak, High Marsh um, have been included, and of course, Northern Grampians still has it. I mentioned. As additionally, Greater Bendigo has been included also, and the um, eligibility criteria have have broadened. So it used to be that a person had to spend a certain amount of time and had to be in a particular industry. Now it's anybody over the age of two who regularly spends time outdoors in a place that puts them at risk. So it means that for the most part, people living in that area 
um, school children will, you know, a whole lot of people will be eligible and they're the eligibility criteria there. Importantly, we think that um, altitude does have a role to keep Culex apart. So you really would get, uh, we think that, you know, for example, Central Highlands is at lower risk. But the important thing is that people travel, people travel from Melbourne and larger metropolitan areas, especially up to the Murray for holidays. Didn't happen so much last time because it was last summer because it was all in flood. But people do travel a lot and it doesn't take much to get my mosquito bite and be unlucky. So when and how to notify, I think Naomi's already mentioned this, but essentially this is what the Act says, that a medical practitioner who reasonably believes that a patient has or may have a notifiable condition or has or may have died with a notifiable condition must notify. And there are certain conditions which require urgent notification and there are others which require routine notification within five days, which can be done in writing. So just like Naomi has done, I've also reproduced that number there for you. So very quickly, I'm just gonna go very quickly through some of the, um, the, the, uh, the mosquito-borne diseases of concern, but I won't go into much detail. So Murray Valley encephalitis is a, fam is a member of the Flavi virus, same as JEV. And indeed, there's been some discussion about whether or not JEV vaccination may have some protective effect in Murray Valley encephalitis virus infection. Truth is, we just don't know. There's a lot about distribution and the epidemiology of what we don't know, because of course, for the most part, for both, M for both MVE virus and JEV, um, the vast majority of people infected will be asymptomatic. Um, the vector in our state is Culex analorostris, as I mentioned. Transmission cycle is very similar to um, JEV, wading birds. And um, JEV, as you know, came to our state for the first time ever last year. Um, and we think the wading birds had migrated on the back of floods earlier in the year, or indeed late 2021, and um, brought infected and uh, brought JEV with them, infected pigs, um, infected mosquitoes, and that's how how humans got exposed and infected. It's much more typically around Northern Territory, around Northern Territory, Western Australia. The last human cases of oh sorry, I'm talking, I'm getting confused with JEV. I'll come to that. Um, Epidemics follow changes in weather patterns, heavy migration, as heavy rainfall migration, as I mentioned. There's been a few epidemics in Australia since 1950. Um, the last human case of um, Murray Valley encephalitis virus was in Victoria, was in Horsham, actually, where we've now had the site of the, um, we've now had a, a, a infected mosquito. In 2011, there were 17 cases, a third of whom died um, across um, South Australia, the Riverland area of South Australia, but went right up to um, the Pilbara region of Western Australia. So that was, a, and that was a, a major flooding, uh, flooding event in 2011, just like 1974 was as well. Um, so mostly all of those cases have been confined to the north of Australia. Um, look, Murray Valley infection, virus infection can kill. And so it's really important to be very mindful of this. Um, Japanese encephalitis can also Chapelinus encephalitis virus can also kill. So the same kinds of, of um, concerns arise. So incubation for MVEV is, can be five to 28 days, typically seven to 12 days, adults and children. Um, risk increases with quantity of mosquito bites. It's an odds game. And so you'd be unlucky to have one bite and for that mosquito to be the one that it's infected. So if there's a swarm, you're more likely to be um, affected. Um, the majority of infections, like I said, are asymptomatic, not mild, and may be confused with something else. Um, sometimes we'll have a rash, not always. And you can see, um, you know, with a, with a typical picture of a febrile illness with headache, myalgia, and occasional rash, it really, you might think this is any other viral kind of illness, uh, with the exception of if there's a rash, it might think, made you think, it might make you think arbovirus. Um, however, a very rare number, but a number does proceed to encephalitis with a prodrome and can progress to um, significant neurological features, confusion and death. Outcomes, case fatality rate around, up, you know, between 15 and 30%, long-term sequelae 30% and complete recovery around 30%. So it's a third, a third, a third, uh, usually only a third escape with um, complete functionality afterwards. Very, very similar and can actually overlap with presentations for other arboviruses. So, of course, what this means for clinicians is that a high index of suspicion is needed, especially around mosquito territory or mosquito time. And if this could be, a, if, if you think this is a mosquito-borne viral condition, could it be MVEV? 
And if they're and if it could be, then have a high index of suspicion. Um, remember, travellers can be bitten too. Early identification is crucial. It's a it's essentially supportive treatment only. So the earlier it's diagnosed and can be put in somewhere in supportive care like ICU, that could be life saving. So there are some tests to do, which is the usual pattern for our arboviruses, is essentially appropriate serology, and then pair that a time later in order to see whether or not the, um, there's been a fourfold increase um, in what we see or indeed seroconversion. Um, for MVE, IgM usually goes up four to nine days post onset, but that's really been, uh, it's, it's so rare that this has been extrapolated by what we might see from other viruses. And then you'll also test um, other sterile sites um, to see if the virus can be um, found. Uh, the, the, the tip is that if you have any suspicion the person feels unwell, they've got a history which um, is, is concerning, um, especially if someone else says, you know, they're not quite themselves today or something like that. My colleagues on this will know exactly the sorts of things that um, family of um, your patients might say if someone's not quite themselves, then by all means, um, ring early for support and assistance. And I put in there again, the phone number for the Grampians Health ID team, very happy to take phone calls from GPs. If you have a concern about an arbovirus um, moving into an encephalitis territory. Um, if Again, if you have a suspicion, if there is a suspicion, it does need an urgent notification for suspected and confirmed cases. JEV, not a, not a, not a particularly different clinical picture. Again, 99% won't experience symptoms. Um, uh, it does have a non-encephalitic picture, but can move to encephalitic disease. Again, prognosis is probably 30, 30, 30, very similarly. Um, and again, uh, the reason I mentioned um, JEV is that you might have heard that on Tuesday, we had some data published, um, or at least made public. Uh, a zero survey was done in over 800 people in three LGAs up around the Murray Valley um, over the course of the sort of the middle third of last year. And uh, um, that was both a targeted and opportunistic survey. So people who were, to my knowledge at least, people who were presenting to have blood taken for another reason were asked also if we could take some extra blood for um, sero, sero survey. And what that found was that one in 30, about one in 30 people were found to have had um, exposure and infection with JEV, which is, which is far more common than we might have expected had we been looking at the numbers and far more than we would have found if we had... Um, um, extrapolated from the 13 cases that were diagnosed in our state and to how many that might we might have seen in that population be exposed in that case. Ross River has a less severe picture and many more um, many more diagnosed cases. I'm sure most of our GPs on this on this session tonight would have seen or at least had some suspicion about a person. Um, look, a rash isn't always um, typical, and indeed, uh, I've discovered, uh, and I've got my ID colleagues on this session too who can answer more questions about this than I know, but I didn't realise that a rash can appear um, up to two weeks before or two weeks after the other symptoms, so it's quite, it can be quite a confusing picture. As I've mentioned, Ross River and Barma Forest are alpha viruses, um, different mosquitoes, um, although can be carried by Culex as well. Um, and typically have can have a longer course and um, with a with a with a fewer number having a longer and longer course, but there can be some long-term sequelae, as you know. Importantly, diagnostically, um, IgM can persist for months in Ross River. Um, Barma Forest, very similarly, um, you know, it accounts for 10% of all the epidemic polyarthritis in northeast in Northeast Australia. The last epidemic of Barma Forest. Barma Forest is just to the north of the Murray River, actually, for your information. Um, and the last epidemic was 2002. But as you can see from these distributions, which we get from the Department of Health, it, it just ticks along. Um, it has been linked with brush tail possums. My um, ID colleague may be able to say more about that. And again, same sort of picture of serology we might be doing and seeing. So in summary, um, in Victoria, over the past few months, we've seen the first level cases of JEV and the re-emergence of Murray Valley encephalitis virus in a setting of record rainfalls. Um, a lot of people are saying this is to do with climate change. I, I do another, I have another side gig, which is as a, um, a climate change uh, um, student and researcher. And um, um, 
We actually can't say it's due to climate change yet. That's kind of a diagnosis in retrospect. But what we can say is that in time, it may be that this episode of JEV for the first time may come to be considered a sentinel event from climate change. Um, I've been teaching from a public health perspective about the public health effects of climate change for about 20 years. And I was teaching 20 years ago. I actually found something I was using to teach 20 years ago, a presentation I did, and where I said talked about the redistribution of this, particularly mosquito-borne diseases. It did not occur to me 20 years ago that I would see this happen in my lifetime. So it was deeply shocking when this did occur last year. Um, clearly, we need to adapt with the enduring sustained public health and community responses in relation to this. This isn't going to go away. It may come and go in waves, but it's unlikely that we will be able to um, expect that. We're not going to be experiencing more JEV and more Murray, Murray Valley encephalitis virus outbreaks, given that climate change will bring increasing intensity and frequency of flooding storms with periods of dryness in between, which may also happen to other mosquito species coming on the move as well. Um, importantly, for severe infections with potential for encephalitis, please, please refer early, call somebody. Best in my experience to call our ID physician team in our region. I'm, I'll leave it to, um, uh, to uh, E. Eugene, who's here, to talk about what the appropriate process would be in Bowen Southwest. But you can call for help these numbers in the Grampians region. Please don't distribute them to patients or the general public, but we're very happy to hear from our GP colleagues anytime. So I've got some, uh, there's a video on, um, on uh, the Department of Health website, which features um, Deb Friedman, many of you will know, and uh, as now the Deputy Chief Health Officer responsible for, communi for communicable diseases. It talks about the risk from indeed Murray Valley encephalitis and JEV. I've also got a whole list of site and links that will help you if you're wanting to find out more about um, mosquito-borne diseases in Victoria. And I've also got a list of um, publications and references that would be useful if you're so inclined. So thank you. I will stop sharing if I can. Thanks, thanks Rosemary. Um, that was very insightful and uh, I was very much learning new things there. I'm not sure I'm too keen on mosquito soup though um, as, a, as a meal, but good to understand how they, they're trapping and, and what it takes to actually come up with a detection. So I appreciate your presentation this evening. I don't see any um, questions at the moment, but if anybody has any, please put them in the Q&A um, and we will answer them at the end. We might move straight along to uh, Dr. Kate Graham to put in a little bit of a roundup for what does what does all this mean when I turn up to my clinic um, on tomorrow morning? So thank you, Kate. Thanks, Naomi. Um, I think as somebody who is currently living in Horsham, I thoroughly enjoy sort of knowing that there are people thinking about the public health impact of um, what's going on with the mosquitoes in our region. So I'll just go on to that first slide. So I think um, I'll start with thinking about the COVID changes that we've had recently and what that has meant for general practice. So at the end of last month, so on 28th of February, the majority of respiratory clinics across the state have now closed. Um, and so this means that not only will GPs need to do the majority of testing going forwards, but it means that we have to sort of think about within our practices how we actually triage and manage the extra patient flow and the phone calls, particularly at a time where I'm sure that most um, sort of switchboards and receptions are completely overloaded. So from a GP perspective, we sort of do need to think about that prioritisation who needs a test and a PCR test that um, is above and beyond that rat test? And so thinking about your priority populations, people who are at increased risk from COVID, how we can actually prioritise care for them. And it's something that will differ from clinic to clinic and with each of your protocols and the amount of um, sort of free appointments that are available in the day. Um, I think one of the key things is ensuring that patients can still access antivirals and really encouraging vaccination and that sort of doing that in a time of sort of community apathy or sort of community fatigue with COVID. I think as everything else has changed across the community, um, all other restrictions have dropped. 
it's really at a stage where it's kind of hard to motivate people um, to keep going with COVID controls, particularly when you've got people who have had a milder infection from COVID. So I think it's really important to sort of keep encouraging that vaccination in terms of that was why you had a mild form of COVID um, and knowing that that vaccination protection isn't something that lasts forever. And just like you have the flu vaccination every year to keep protecting you, it is important to keep going with those boosters. Um, but the antiviral access and sort of awareness is still something to think about sort of as we come up to cold and flu season. Um, infection control with COVID in your day-to-day -day practice is still really important. Um, thinking about those triage protocols, how you can actually get patients in, where you put people, um, how to keep people apart from each other. This is something that's not just a COVID specific thing. I'm sure most of you will have um, experienced a lot of the no, uh, norovirus outbreaks that have been um, going around. And I think I I'd like gastro patients to sort of be kept away too. And it's thinking about what conditions do need that sort of quarantine away from everyone else. How do you do that? How do you achieve that? Do you put everyone at the end of the day? They're all things to sort of think about from a practice perspective. And depending on your role within the practice, you may not have a lot of control over bookings or how things are run, but it's something important to bring up and discuss within the environment that you work in. So I'll just go on to the next slide. So mosquito-borne disease, I think that knowing how to test and what to test for, because there are some complexities, um, I think, as Rosemary raised, um, that PCR can be done in that first few days of illness. And I think... Now, for most patients with a sort of typical Ross River, Barmer Forest presentation, you're not really going to get them in that early acute phase. Um, you tend to see them a bit later when they've come in and realise that their aches aren't going away. Sometimes you will see them early. But I think one of the key things to sort of outline when you're sending something off to pathology, and particularly at a time of year when people may have travelled within the period of time beforehand, is putting down the locations where people have been because I think when you're adding in arboviral serology, the labs sort of are going to be able to determine things that they may want to look at, depending on where somebody has been. So if you put arboviral serology down on a path form, they will actually choose depending on the history that you put on there. You can put specific things, but as we've sort of um, discussed in the previous things, mild forms of Japanese encephalitis, Murray uh, Valley encephalitis, um, can overlap with Ross River, Barmer. There can be overlaps with all sorts of things as well. So it's kind of hard to sort of just put one thing down unless you've got that sort of acute joint presentation, in which case you're going to sort of go more towards the Ross River and Barmer. Um, I think one of the really key things is that you can't differentiate between mosquito, viral, neurological infections and other CNS infections. And all of them are emergencies. And if you suspect them, you treat it like an emergency. Um, I think you're only going to be testing for these kind of things in general practice in milder sort of settings, or you're going to be calling for help for these things. Um, it's, you know, thinking about it like any other encephalitis presentation, meningitis presentation, it's an acute emergency. Um, but as well as that sort of emergency management, if you suspect it, you need to call that number as well. It's that suspected cases as well as confirmed. Um, so thinking about sort of as well, if you get a positive test result from people with a mild illness, um, it still is important, I think particularly for that Murray Valley encephalitis, um, to follow that patient up and make sure that they don't get worse because Murray Valley encephalitis in particular does have that tendency in some cases to worsen into an encephalitis, whereas Japanese encephalitis virus um, tends to sort of have its encephalitic presentations quite early. Um, so I think one of the key things, undertake the Japanese encephalitis vaccination education learning module. Um, if your practice isn't set up to um, vaccinate, contact the PHN, have a chat as to how to do that. Um, use the consent form um, and think about setting up a checklist in practice software. Because the um, vaccinations are live virus vaccines, you've got to think about um, spacing from other live virus vaccines, and you've got to think about the people for whom that's not going to be suitable. So um, in terms of the very young population, the under nine months, 
um, and people who have immunocompromise and a number of other criteria. So that's why it's sort of really important to go through. The consent form doesn't sort of tell you which way to go, but there are two different um, Japanese encephalitis virus vaccines. One of them is the one that you will mostly get in general practice, which is the live virus vaccine. Um, there's limited stock of the other one for these cases who won't be able to have that one. Um, and continue to advise mosquito bite prevention advice. Like I think that that is just one of the key things that we can do within general practice, particularly when the community in these areas is going to have um, more and more knowledge coming up around sort of what to do um what to do they're going to be thinking about that Japanese encephalitis um, vaccine they may not be able to access it straight away so thinking about what to tell them giving them resources and I think in particular that advising parents that it is safe to use DEET um, on children but it's just making sure that it's not on areas that are going to be sort of put in the mouth or those kind of things. So there are lots of good um, education resources available through the department um, pages and also through things like Better Health Channel, the Beat the Bite um, resources are really good. So I've just gone to the next slide. So just quickly to end things off, Health Pathways, if you haven't come across it already, um, is a really good resource. It's a resource that we have within um, Western Victoria um, PHN and it's got up-to-date information. We've got over 800 um, pages and pathways on it on a huge variety of clinical topics. <clears throat> We've got lots of up-to-date information on here which is sort of above and beyond what you'll find if you just do a Google search and end up at the department website. So we've got all the sort of infectious diseases, LPHU contacts. Um, we've got the clinical management advice, which is sort of taken from our subject matter experts from the department, all those kind of things. And we've got lots of resources and links that are all collated in one place and they're collated into patient resources, health professional resources, education modules, so that you can just log straight in and find things. So it's a password protected site so that we're not putting those um, important phone numbers out into the public and overwhelming our colleagues in the health services. And so please email that email on there if you don't have access already and we will arrange it for you. Um, I'll just quickly go on to the next slide just to sort of quickly show you a bit of a run through. That's our main page, which has a search one. But like when you go onto a page, you'll see the different sections and they're generally broken up into assessment, management and referral. Each of the pages may or may not, um, depending on the condition, have red flags. And the red flags are the things that you want to sort of have stand out at you. Practice points are things that you might think about um, and they've got a little bit of information under there that isn't shown. But that information section down the bottom is where you've got for health professionals or for patients. And then I think, was that my last slide? Oh, no, there's one more. So the referral section. So this is just a snapshot. This is actually about, it would have fit on about three pages with the information that we have from Barwon Southwest. So under each of the sections, we'll have Grampians, Barwon Southwest, um, Wimmera um, and we'll have the sort of Warrnambool South Coast kind of as separate drop downs on this area um, depending on what services we have. So in the LPHUs we've obviously got Grampians, Bow and Southwest. Under each of them we'll have the contact points and service specific criteria and this is really important to be able to know which areas are covered so that you know, okay, this is for me and these are the people I want. Um, and they may have in that clinical criteria as well as to what referrals are and aren't accepted. So I think that's all for me. Thanks, Kate. That was a great roundup for the evening. Um, just opening it now for anybody. If there, anybody has any questions, please drop that in the Q&A section or even chat if you're not sure how Q&A works. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank our presenters this evening, um, acknowledging Naomi's not here, so Naomi, Dr. Naomi Clark, Professor Rosemary Aldrich, uh, and Dr. Kate Graham for presenting. And a thank you to our other public health physicians uh, who are also here this evening. Um, and, that, and available to answer any questions. I think we might be a bit silent here because those were some pretty comprehensive um, presentations that have covered all our bases when it comes to any changes um, uh, 
we have one in the chat. Um, thanks for the comment, Richard. Any ideas for costs of vaccines? Um, I can for costs for. I'm assuming you don't make COVID vaccines because that hasn't changed. Um, providers were sent um, a bulletin with all of the um, MBS funding attached to that um, last week or the week before. Uh, but with regard to JV vaccines, um, the Victorian um, Department of Health uh, are making the JV vaccine available to. Um, LGAs to deliver uh, to the general population and they are encouraging general practitioners to also make it available to their um, patients coming through as well. The expectation is that a JEV vaccine would be a bulk build item. Um, it is free for the practice to get hold of the, um, the vaccine. You do need to have a OneLink account to order it. However, you do not order through your OneLink account. It's uh, emailing um, your interest in the program to immunisation at health.vic.gov from the top of my head. Um, but please ch have a check out for the West Vic news coming out um, next week because the information will be in there as well. There was um, a PHN uh, send out on Monday as well with some information uh, for you there if you'd like to get involved. We do encourage practices to get involved. Um, and I think it's a, a good time to note that JEV vaccine can be co-administered um, with COVID vaccine. COVID-19 um, vaccine. So it might be an opportunity for you to give somebody a two for one deal, um, which I'm sure is better on Big Macs than vaccines. But uh, if you get the opportunity to get it into community, then uh, it's a great time to take it. Um, I don't think there's, is there a vaccine for MVE? No, there's not. It, yeah. Wonderful. Got two wonderful, very experienced clinicians shaking their head at me. Fantastic. Um, perfect. Did anybody else have any comments from my um, esteemed colleagues here? Uh, Naomi, it's you, Jane. I just want to um, thank and commend the three presenters. Really great covering a very complex area of public health. So well done to all of our speakers and thank you. I hope to ask some questions. Thanks, Eugene. I concur with your assessment there. We're very lucky in Western Victoria to have access to such um, knowledgeable and competent um, clinicians and experts. So we appreciate that. Um, without any further questions, um, I might take this opportunity to um, wrap the evening up and yield some time back to people's evenings. So I appreciate everybody coming along. Again, if you do have any um, questions or concerns that you're not that haven't been answered this evening, uh, we did put our info at West Vic PHN. You're welcome to contact, and I will follow up with that. Uh, and if needed, follow up with the the local public health units um, if needed. So um, please enjoy your evenings. Thank you for coming along, um, and look forward to seeing you next time, uh, likely uh, later in the year. Hopefully, there's no new public health uh, emergencies that um, are worth uh, taking our time to talk about. Thank you all. Thanks, Naomi. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks all. The, sli Good work. the slides will be sent out everywhere as well. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>